Hi, my name is Jerry Fostati. My book is called As You Were, The Tragedy at Valcartier. It's an account of an accidental grenade explosion that occurred in 1974 at an army base in Quebec. The blast killed six 14- and 15-year-old boys and injured over 50 others. As you were. I had thought that nothing would surprise me in an email anymore, but with the sudden appearance of his name on my computer, I was clearly mistaken. His message was sitting in the middle of a pile of messages, but my eye was drawn to it in the same way one is compelled to look at something moving at the periphery of vision when all else is still. The subject line was, Valcartier, 1974. I almost didn't want to read the message. As I clicked the mouse to open it, I suddenly became aware of my heart beating, my breathing becoming shallow. The three-word message, like its author, got to the point. Were you there? I had been there all right. I hit the reply button and began typing. Yes, I have thought of you often. I hope you are well. Send. I sat there looking at the screen, as if expecting that a reply would come back right away. Eventually, I pulled myself away from the computer and headed to my basement in search of some old boxes of memorabilia I had been dragging around with me for decades. These items had no practical value, and I'd never use them again, but they were the benchmarks of my life. I came across a small red leather journal given to me in 1972 when I was training in Banff at the National Army Cadet Camp. I was 16. I did not exactly excel at keeping a journal then, so within the red leather binding are just the addresses of half a dozen or so British cadets I trained with that year. When they were finished with us, they were going off to the British Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. Their home addresses had quaint names like Sifton House and Rose Hill. One fellow's home address was the British Embassy in Prague. His father, apparently, was the military attaché. They were so different from us. We were loud and raw, They seemed sophisticated, polished, conservative, which for some of us made them a target for mockery. That was the year Paul McCartney released Give Ireland Back to the Irish. The record was on the canteen jukebox, and every time the Brits came in, someone would spend a quarter to play it. The Brits, of course, viewed this as bordering on treason. In retaliation, one would stand on another's shoulders, unhook the large photograph of Queen Elizabeth from the wall, and together they would run out of the canteen with the picture, while a third Brit held the door open. They would stand outside until the song ended and then calmly rehang the picture on the wall. This pattern repeated over the course of a few days until our commanding officer got wind of it. Instead of having the song removed from the jukebox, however, he forbade the Brits to remove the picture from the canteen. At first, they fumed and made a great show of disgust whenever the song played, which was annoyingly often. One day, however, they began to sit there smiling, no matter how often the song came on, continuing to grin even when the crowd sang along. Eventually, the usual response not forthcoming. The jukebox became relatively quiet. It was purely by chance that I discovered the reason for the Brit's newly relaxed attitude. I had arrived late and was looking for a place to sit when I spotted a few of my friends lounging at a table near the back wall. Give Ireland back to the Irish was blaring on the jukebox. As I stepped around an overstuffed chair to sit down, I glanced up at the wall in front of me to see the picture of Her Majesty sporting the smallest cotton balls stuck to her ears. No one else had noticed, and I never said a word to anyone. Whenever I see those addresses in the small red journal, I'm reminded of that story. Memory is fluid that way. One thing can link quickly to another, creating a string of memories, just as in a treasure hunt, where one clue leads to another. I returned to the computer about an hour later to look at the message again, Were you there? and to reread my reply. But as I anxiously awaited his response, I found myself lured down a path I did not really care to retread. I don't remember saying goodbye to anyone when I left the base in 74. I guess I just wanted to get home, to leave the explosion and the deaths and injuries and all that had happened far behind me. In retrospect, I suppose I thought home was the answer. Home implied stability, normality. Even at age 18, the irony was not lost on me that I had tried to get away from home for the same reasons I later wanted to return. I will see all these people from the base soon enough, I had thought. I was wrong, of course. Most of them I would never see again. The young feel that the world and their relationships will remain as they leave them, like folding over a page of a novel and walking away, trusting the story will continue where they left off once we resume reading. I've learned, however, that like reading a book, the longer you put aside a relationship, the more likely you'll have to start at the beginning to make any sense of it and regain continuity.